and welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 6. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. That's Paul Chion. Thanks so much for coming along for Standard. And uh, as promised, and as everybody knows, a lot of Oko uh, out in the field. And in fact, things are starting to get very real with the Oko mirrors because our main feature match this round features just that. Two Simic Oko decks going, or Simic food, we call it, going at each other. Both of them 6-0. and Brad Nelson versus Mats Tornros. Uh, from Sweden, and uh, they have slightly different builds. You know, we call these the flex slot, right, where you can kind of choose what you want to put in that upper end. Yeah, yeah. I think the core for any of the, I guess, you have the Simic food core, right? You have, of course, the Gilded Goose, Once Upon a Time, Paradise Druid, Oko, Wicked Wolf, Nissa, Hydra Crisis. But then you have roughly about six to eight cards that you can kind of pick and choose what you want to do, right? If you want to go straight Simic, you can try to go the tempo route with cards like Brazen Borrower. You can also play Ether Gust. And then, of course, if you go black, you can you can choose between Vraska, Noxious Grasp, and then, you know, some some of the heavy hitters, right? Some of the six right. mana cards. Lots of really good options, actually, at six. Yeah, and we do see a lot of those sort of sideboard-ish cards like uh, like Vraska and then just straight up sideboard cards that are in the main deck like Noxious Grasp. And we do have copies of those in the feature match area here as well for both players, though the splits are different. Brad is running the full four Noxious Grasp uh, and his flex slots are two Vraska Golgari Queen and two Casualties of War. Where Mats on the other side of the battlefield has two Noxious Grasp, two Ether Gust, and then he split a Liliana, Dreadhorde General, and a Ugin the Ineffable for his uh, high end flex slot. Yeah, so th that's kind of where we're at here. Yeah, the really interesting thing is the fact that he's choosing to play two copies of Ether Gust along with Noxious Grasp. Typically, Ether Gust is the card that you choose to play in your deck if you don't have access to black, right? Because if you have access to black, you can just play the hard removal spell in Noxious Grasp. But uh, Tornoros actually just choosing to go for the 2-2 split here instead, despite the fact that he is a Sultai food deck. Interesting. Most of the time, you'd rather have the... The grasp, right? Yeah, but but sometimes, you know, the fact that you can actually just counter something and prevent your opponent from getting an activation of a Planeswalker could be pretty relevant. Just to keep it off the turn even for a moment. All right, so here's an X equals two Hydroid Crisis to kick off the festivities for Mots as far as the bigger stuff goes. Though not huge, just, uh, just a little Crisis. And he's going to pass the turn back over to our MPL player, Brad Nelson, the Bard. The king of standard? Yeah, and I think this is really where Brad might want to ch turn that Paradise Druid potentially into a 3-3 three, three here because, w w you know, some of the important kind of places to... Oh, it looks like he's not going to do it, but some of the important things is to try to prevent your opponent from getting to five mana because the first person to play Nissa who shakes the world, you know, tends to be the person who can really leverage the mana and the tempo that you get from it. So um, it looks like Brad... Potentially, by, by taking this up, might have an answer here. He plays Oko and passes a turn back with his own Paradise Druid left untapped. Oko likely to take a bit of damage here from the Hydroid Crisis in the air, but uh, not under threat of death at this point. Matsu says, I'm going to attack Oko, so Oko's loyalty is going to fall down to four. But this is a big turn here for Matsu, because if we do see Nissa who shakes the world, which we don't, then that could have been huge. We probably would have seen that pre-combat, but at any rate, we see Hydroid Crisis number two, but this one's only for three, the awkward. Yeah, typically this is not the, the point. This is not a, a typical sizing that we see from the Crisis. Usually you see it for four potentially more than that, but you know, this is probably letting Brad know that, okay, he's digging and he wants to just continue putting pressure onto the battlefield because of course there is that planeswalk on the other side in Oko. Yeah, Mott's definitely uh, Hydroid Crisis flooded here. He's got yet another one in his hand still. And Brad is really looking for some interactive pieces, and the deck does have a good amount of those. You know, multiple copies of Vraska, four copies of Noxious Grasp, along with Wicked Wolf, which would be very strong here. You hear the judge pop in and just uh, encourage the players to make sure that they're playing at a speed commensurate with finishing the match on time. And occasionally, yeah, these matches can go long. 
a lot of answers for players and a lot of permanents kind of left over that don't necessarily have a way to punch through. And when you find yourself in that situation, uh, yeah, you do need to make sure that the pace of play is nice and crisp. So you hear the players say, okay, we'll do so. Sure. Absolutely. And now Brad actually choosing not to get the 3-3 three -three crisis off the battlefield, but choosing to get the 2-2-1 two -two instead have that as an option as a blocker and then turn the Paradise Druid into Nelk to kind of try to shut down Tornrose's mana. Yeah, Brad ends up getting an untapped Wicked Wolf with a food token at the ready in exchange for taking out the smaller of the two crazies. All right, here's Vraska though. And this is why Vraska is put into these decks and why people stretch their mana into black. It's uh, to, to take down Oko. Yeah, it also works very well with Oko as you get to create kind of a token every single turn, and now you have something to eat with the Vraska because typically you don't really want to be sacrificing your lands to draw a card off the Vraska. You can see in preparation for the flood of Okos here in the feature match area at the tournament, we've got a little overlay there. So anything that gets turned into an elk gets that put over it so that we can quickly uh, identify it at a glance and those are going to get some some work this weekend for sure i'm sure a lot of those have been printed out for the tournament i think they printed a thousand of them but I, I don't think we'll use a thousand maybe but maybe maybe <laughs> all right so brad's going to go to work here though he's going to use that main deck noxious grasp of which he has four copies to take down the elk that was left over, it's gone. That leaves no blockers back for Vraska, and Wicked Wolf is free to chip in and send her pack in. So now Mott's, who's, you know, use up his mana every turn, is now down to just the 3-3 Krasis and his land. So he's going to need to have something to come back here. And he's going to go digging. He's going to use Once Upon a Time to try to find a threat, although he has a decent backup plan. He does have an Oko in hand in case he doesn't find one. Yeah, and it looked like he was also ho holding an Ugin the Ineffable, which he is was. which is kind of the top end threat that he's looking to go for, but he does need to find the land to do so. So he did reveal Watery Grave here, and uh, this is going to be a nice turn. You know, he's going to be able to run out an Oko here and also have land number six, which is going to set him up nicely for next turn because it looks like he also has a third Hydroid Crisis in hand, uh, which he can get additional value off of now given that he has six lands. So now Oko is going to turn Wicked Wolf into an Elk, and Brad has a decision here on if he'd like to eat the food with the Wolf, which would give it a plus one, plus one counter, which would stay on and leave a 4-4 four, four Elk rather than a 3-3 three, three Elk. Okay. Depends on what he wants to do with the food. He says, fine, yeah. it's an Elk. And Brad's going to untap and see what's lurking on the top of his library here. This is a pretty uh, typical you know, opening early into mid, kind of trending towards the late game sequences here. A lot of trading of resources, leveraging creatures to kill planeswalkers, leveraging removal spells to kill planeswalkers, excuse me, to kill creatures to clear the way to kill planeswalkers. And basically it'll come down to who's left standing with some incremental advantage and then a big blowout play. All right, and here is Brad's heavy hitter here in Casualties of War. And this is going to get three permanents. He's going to kill a creature, a land, and a planeswalker. Wow, did I say blowout play? Because that's what I meant. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is, is big. unreal. But we also know that Tornros has a grip full of very powerful spells. If he can simply draw land number six, I mean, I think Brad might be out of gas here. Yeah, and he does have that land now off the top of the library there, the uh, breeding pool that he just drew. So he's got another Hydroid Crisis, or he can run out Ugin the Ineffable. Yeah, but given that there are two creatures in play, he might want to wait to have a few more ways to defend the Ugin here. So wouldn't be surprised if he runs out either a 4-4 Hydroid Crisis, or it uh, looks like he's going to go for the Wicked Wolf here, get that Paradise Druid off the battlefield. And remember, the Wicked Wolf on Brad Nelson's side of the table is an Elk, so they would simply trade. Yeah, and it looks like Mots is going to just go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Even though his Wicked Wolf has a much higher potential going forward, he wants the board to be as clear as possible so that he can play this Ugin the Ineffable and take over the board. Yeah, now he's just and here it is. slam the Ugin. Oh, no, oh, never mind. Cancel that order. It's Hydroid Crisis. This time it's going to be for four, so he's going to get a couple of extra cards off of it and, of course, have the nice big flyer and pass the turn back. Another food token gets made by Gilded Goose on end step as Brad 
draws his card for the turn, and boy, he really wants to find some, he well, a find, Hydroid Crisis. He, oh, okay. Uh, he really needs to find an action spell, and that's what exactly he? what he wanted. Mm -hmm. he boom, boom, and boom, eat up a food, play an untapped Temple Garden. Although that would make it a 7-7, seven, seven, which only just makes it a little bit bigger, but it doesn't actually draw you an additional card. Yeah, the question is, does he really care about the third food token? And sure, you don't want to throw away resources for nothing, but it is a question. Would you rather have a plus one, plus one counter in your crisis or a food token? Yeah, and it looks like he values having the food in play because, yep. you know, of course, he could top deck something like an additional Wicked Wolf. Absolutely. It's not even impossible that the life matters down right. the stretch, where the plus one, plus one on the counter on the crisis is unlikely to be super important. And so he's going to go land Goose after that and pass the turn back. Wow, that's oh, there's the crisis number four now for Mots. <laughs> He's played one for two, three, four. But now we're going to see Vraska Gorgari Queen once again. And that is, of course, able to take out the crisis. And that means Mots gets to slam in for four. And Goose Goose, he says. Double Goose. Double Goose, double food. But Brad Super has size. drawn a lot of cards here. Including he another Casualties, Paul. Okay, and, and that's huge. He's got the two copies in, in his deck, and, and now he's gonna, going to be able to get four permanents. There's a food, a <laughs> creature, a planeswalker, and a land. Wow! He can also, interestingly, take Mots off of his black mana at this point, outside of the Gilded Geese. Right. Although, given that there are no double black spells... Doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it won't matter too so much. So it's just a, the, the number of lands, I guess, that's important here. Still. Oh, he's got Noxious Grasp here, though. So how is he going to play this? Okay. So Get rid of Vraska. Looks like he's taking his time here. He must have just have another threat to play this turn, then. He must. No, okay, no, he's just playing it turn. very patiently He here. does have a second copy of Casualties of War in his hand. Perhaps daring Mots to play another Planeswalker. And is this just it's Crisis just number four? Crisis, yeah. Oh, so this one's for cards. six. It's so insane. This is the fourth Crisis. It's two, three, four, and six are the numbers. And there's three cards and three life. And now he has ten power in the air worth of Crisis. So, so Brad's going to make two food off of the Gilded Geese and then sack one of them to get a little bit of life. He has accrued four food, but he is going to need to fire off Casualties of War to kill one of the Hydroid Crisis, and then might as well get the other stuff, too. Yeah, at this point, given that there are two giant Crises on the battlefield, probably has to fire off this Casualties unless he found something else. Well, it looks like he found something else. Very patient is Brad Nelson. He found Golgari, excuse me, Vrasco Golgari Queen, and as we saw on Maps' side last turn, that's a good answer for Hydroid Crisis because it actually does fall under that converted mana cost three or less once it's on the battlefield. Yeah, I wonder if he's waiting for for Mats to play something like a Nissa, right? Because if mm -hmm. he does, with all the cards that he's drawn, he's so likely to probably have found a Nissa at this point. If you play a Nissa, you animate a land, <laughs> that's an additional target for the for the casualties. But and he would leave himself with no answer for Anissa, which, as we know, go, if it goes unchecked a couple of turns, it just takes over. Absolutely. Take two. So Brad values these uh, golden geese. He's not going to throw the double chump block just to keep Vraska alive. And there's finally Ugin the Ineffable. Uvin's going to get plussed, so that card's going to get exiled face down. It becomes a 2-2 spirit. But when it leaves the battlefield, you put it into your hand. Yeah, yeah and... and now, you know, some of that patience is going to be paying off a little bit. Brad still needs to string together more cards, but now he's, his Casualties of War is going to be able to get that Ugin off the battlefield, along with the Krasis, along with the land, and along with that food token. Planeswalker, creature, artifact, overgrown token. Bang, 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 says Brad Nelson. Planeswalker, creature, artifact, and your overgrown tomb all going away to a four-for-one from Casualties of War. Nice little four for one, not bad. Jeez, you gotta feel like this is gonna put Pratt in a position to pull ahead here, yet he doesn't really seem to be able to. He has all the food you could possibly want and more coming from the golden geese, but or from the gilded geese, but he's got work to do still. 
I mean, the issue is Matt's drew all four copies of Hydroid Crisis. So despite right. the fact that Brad's been able to get two, three, or four for ones off the casualties of war, if, it, if anything, he's, he's barely at parity at best. One of the geese gets gobbled up by the Wicked Wolf. And it looks like Brad is just going to go ahead and sacrifice a food rather than making one. He's back up to 14, and he really needs to find some action here. One of his big hitters, a Hydroid Crisis, would be perfect. It's a Wicked Wolf, and that's actually pretty good. He's got a lot of food. Yeah, but he won't be able to get Matt's Wicked Wolf no. off the battlefield here because he has two activations from the Gilded Goose. Oh, well, Ooh. it's still on the stack, it looks like, so Ether Gust is going to hit it. Yeah, and it wouldn't have really mattered. Even if it was on the battlefield, before the trigger resolves, you can still, of course, Aether Gust the Wicked Wolf. Yeah, in fact, he may have actually let him have the chance to do so. There. Right. Because it did look like it resolved, so maybe he was just saying, okay, Brad, are you going to sacrifice the food? Because if you do, then I'm going to get you. Yep. And Brad, you can tell he's not super happy with it. The Wicked Wolf was good enough to keep back on top of his library, but also not what he really, really wants, which is like a crisis or something along those lines. Brad does have a lot of life here to work with, however. That's eight food. So Gilded Goose is going to get gobbled up by the opposing Wicked Wolf. It's also going to make a food on its way out, and then the other one's going to make a food, too. Ooh, and that is Anissa who shakes the world. Finally, where's she been the whole time? W waiting until Brad casts all of his casualties <laughs> apparently. And Brad's like, of course. Yeah, Matt's has, has been really relentless here. He has cast four Hydrate Crazies, Anissa, an Ugin the Ineffable this game. It is going to be very difficult for Brad to overcome that, given that he's cast more copies of Gilded Goose than anything else. Yeah, but Brad is sitting at a good amount of life here. He yeah. can still survive a few more turns to give himself kind of that chance to draw the Hydra Crisis, because I think that is specifically the card that he needs. Either that or an answer for that Nissa Shakes the War. Because, I mean, if you look, that, that one Wicked Wolf that's in play, that's actually preventing Matt from just being able to attack with anything. That is. And, of course, with two copies of Gilded Goose, Brad Nelson is producing a lot of food here and giving himself a buffer. So, yeah, now Brad's going to be able to make two food and sack three to gain nine life. And he's going to go to 21. Wow. If you're wondering why some of these matches take a long time, this is precisely why. This because why. if the games do go long, I mean, you just have so many ways to generate food and gain a lot of life. Brad's board state looks like that platter we got at dinner last night. <laughs> too, <laughs> much food. Food. Yeah. too much food. Too much food. It was good, though, right? I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm, recovering. It's still, it's still sitting heavy for me, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> is Brad winning? He's at 21. He, 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 that is not the way that we, we decide that, no. <laughs> not. <laughs> Paradise Druid. So Brad still just hoping to try to find something awesome and hasn't been able to. And, you know, the card that's applying pressure to this board state is Nissa, right? Yeah. This is the card that is like TikTok, Brad. Yes, you can gain a lot of life, but you are going to need to find a big heavy hitter to kind of blow this game open. And it's going to have to be sooner than later before Nissa develops a board that even a Wicked Wolf can't hold back. Right. Now, Matt's probably can even just wait till Nissa gets to nine before choosing to use the minus ability and get all the force out of his deck and also turn all of them indestructible. Did Brad find it? He must have found something. He found another copy of Wicked Wolf. Well, this does cut down the food generation from Matt's side of the battlefield. He's likely going to be able to kill the other Gilded Goose, as really dealing with one of these 3-3s three is not going to do a whole lot. So, you know, I mean, Brad said he get 27 life. He is. You know? He still has seven food. But, oh, this is interesting. So Matt's actually went for the ultimate right away. Rather than doing what you said, which is, you know, it looked like the way was clear. Now, there was a little bit of risk there, right, if Brad's like, oh, look, I found my 
you know, noxious he, he grass. He has to have drawn another Nissa. This is the only way I would ah. see, the reason I would see him go for this. I see. Because, you know, Nissa's kind of your, your, your way to win. But you, look, look what he did. He only got five lands out of his deck. Sure, right. that's good, but you'd rather be able to make a 3-3 three, three every single turn. So, I mean, the only thing card that I can think he possibly drew here is probably another Nissa who shakes the world. All right. And look at that, it's five mana for Nissa who shakes the world. Yep. And it makes perfect sense. And now Brad says, I've seen enough and is gonna scoop him up. Indestructible lands down on the ground makes it nigh impossible for Brad to get through. So he says, look, I don't care what my life total is. I don't have a way to finish this game. And I am gonna call it a game. So that is game number one going to Mats Tornros. Uh, and Look, he just threw the haymakers at him, right? Again, we saw the full four copies of Hydroid Crisis resolved by him. Now, they weren't all huge, right? There was a 2-2 two, two and 3-3, three, three, but then they started getting bigger, 6-6, six, 7-7, six, seven, seven, that kind of thing, and then he was able to ride those Planeswalkers. Yeah, and this this also just showed that the casualties of war is not necessarily the end-all, be-all, right? Brad drew two copies of this card, but he Got a four-for-one off of one of them. Right, and he barely survived because, you know, this deck just has so many ways to gain value, right? You have the Planeswalkers, you have Nissa, you have Oko, you have the, but then of course, Krasis, also very, very important in this matchup. Yeah, and you can tell how powerful it is at applying pressure to the opponent and also restocking your hand. We've seen it, we'll see more of it. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back though, we'll be right back into standard action. Don't go anywhere. Recently, the, the deck that I've played at the uh, MC level have always been like the tier one, like the, 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 you know, the best decks. So just come into the, in the tournament with the best deck. And uh, with my teammates, very often the, that involves practicing the mirror match. Uh, when I was more like uh, my, a lower level at the PTs, we usually were practicing to see which was the best deck and then playing that deck, but really didn't focus too much in the mirror. But now, uh, recently, I'm just starting to practice, me and Aviara start to practice way more the mirror match than before because we can identify what's the best deck and then just have like a full day of mirror match. So I would suggest starting by actual practicing the mirror match before the event because a lot of people just, you know, are very new to this. They don't know very much uh, what to do in these things but yeah and then other than that um, basically all you've learned on for yourself by playing the game you, have, you can put in your opponent so like if your opponent does a play that you see yourself doing sometimes you can identify what do they have in their hand and stuff like that also sideboarding for example i'm playing soul tide this pt and it's very very complicated to sideboard for example on the draw you might like this full stroke and on the play you might like veil of summer so whenever you are the person on the play you have to remember that your opponent is on the draw and is having this full stroke and not veil of summer so you can kind of put all the skills that you learn for yourself into your opponent in these little things uh, in the constructed mirror match spe specifically for food mirrors uh, it's very important to save your removal for the right targets. Uh, Ogo, Thief of Crowns, it's a very powerful card, but it's much stronger in the early game than it is in the late game. So maybe it's turn five or six, you don't need to kill it right away, and it's best to save your removal spell for Anissa. If you guys are facing a mirror match, you just have to set all the turns, think about two, three turns ahead, because this, this format is all about snowballing Planeswalkers. So you have to kill the, their Planeswalkers while having your Planeswalkers. If you ever find yourself in a constructed mirror match, I would say that it's really important to figure out for game three how your opponent sideboarded. Since you both have the same cards, there's a lot of different things you guys can do and you can game each other like next level. So I think it's really important to um, pay attention to that. Well, one of the things to realize about a mirror match is you're still playing a normal game of magic. And even though you might have the same cards in your deck, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the same cards in your hand or the same sequence of draws. So um, identifying patterns is good, but you should also recognize the particulars of the situation and play to whatever advantage you have in that particular game. And welcome back to the feature match area here for Mythic Championship 6. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion, and we're going to take a little Look, see over what's going on on our side table there where you see Thomas Hendricks playing Celestia Adventure. That's that green-white deck versus Guillaume Salvador Arnal, who is on Jund Sacrifice. So a bit of a different look from what we saw on our main match there. And it looks like Thomas Hendricks finds himself up a game. Uh-oh. So what do we got here? 
two witches' ovens and nothing else going on? Just a goose? These are typically my opening hands every time I dabble in the sacrifice deck. <laughs> Lots of ovens and no action. But of course, we, we've, we've seen you know, the deck do some, some extremely powerful things as well. And you know, you know, Thomas is up a game, likely had some explosive starts, but I, I think there are some cards here in Arnold's deck that, that can really do a lot of work. Mayhem Devil specifically. You know, if you have ways to sacrifice permanence, Mayhem Devil, you know, many of the cards in the, the Celestia Adventure deck has one toughness. So you can really utilize that Mayhem Devil in conjunction with a lot of the sacrifice effects to kind of just obliterate your opponent's board. Or Thomas can play four creatures and a venerated Loxodon and nothing dies. Well, Guillaume hopes that doesn't happen and is going to need to have something come up pretty quickly here because Thomas Hendricks has the dream opener here. An Edgewall Innkeeper that's arrived? Times two. Oh. Yeah, so he's just going off here oh my this goodness. turn. I mean, when we popped in here, he had a couple of random creatures on the battlefield, and he's just drawn four cards this turn and now playing a Loxodon for free. Oh, and this is a really nice play here from Guillaume. He would... You would think that all the creatures are safe because of the yeah, because they all had an extra counter, but given that the Massacre Girl trigger was on the stack, he sat the he goose. killed the goose in response, and uh, that kind of allowed everything to die. So that was awesome. He needed all of he it. He needed too. the sweeper. Yeah, yeah. and the goose. <laughs> he didn't have enough mana otherwise. So now he has Massacre Girl on the Massacre Girl on the battlefield. But here's the downside, right? There were two Edgewall Innkeepers. So it's while Thomas lost that big board, he still has five spells in his hand. He's ready to go. Yeah. And that new addition, right? We, we've seen the Selesnya Tokens deck before, but the addition of the Edgewall Innkeeper has made it so that you do have that late game staying power. If you do have Edgewall Innkeeper, you do draw some cards. Sure, your opponent can play a sweeper, but you can just litter the board once again. And that was a serious problem with the deck in the past. And look at this, Guillaume doing a really good yeah, job. Now he plays Vraska to kill the Lovestruck Beast. And he's sitting at 19, so... Yeah. And this is Flower? Thomas Hendricks not doing what he wants to do at this stage. And plenty of food here as well for Arnold to sacrifice that Vraska to just continue drawing cards every turn. Oh, but Ooh, hello. That was a good one. Questy B, Questy B hits the battlefield and is going to start slamming. Of course, he gets to just attack uh, Guillaume's life total directly because he can just uh, do the extra four damage over to Vraska for free, which is exactly what he's done. Oh, but here we go, Cauldron Familiar, and you talked about it a minute ago. The Mayhem Devil hits the battlefield. Yeah, did he? Did he hit Thomas for one? I assume he did. With the, with the Cauldron Familiar with the trigger? Cauldron Familiar trigger. It should be, yeah, I mean, he has to say it, but it should be right. 2019 the other way. The nice thing about that questing beast that is in play. Sacrify one damage, food, sacrifice the food. Well, first of so he's going to actually be able to kill the questing beast here, Paul. Right, right. Uh, with the three food that he has in play, he can sacrifice that Cauldron Familiar multiple times, or uh, excuse me, sacrifice all those food to get that Questing Beast off the battlefield. And now Thomas is going to have to fight through that Mayhem Devil, along with the interaction between the Cauldron Familiar and the Witch's Oven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sacrifice. So, one damage. He's going to start doing him one at a time here, but Mayhem Devil critically says whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, it does one damage to any target. And that's any player, any permanent. Right. So, Absolutely. you know, when you activate a Witch's Oven, you sacrifice something. When you sacrifice the food to get back the uh, the cat, the Cauldron Familiar, that triggers it as well. So this is a lot of damage that he can throw around, and it's actually going to be very difficult for Thomas to keep permanence on the battlefield, especially given how small they start out on his side. Yeah, and, and, and you know, this is the reason to play this deck, right? It's like, mm -hmm. in a vacuum, you look at these cards, you're like, what's going on? Like, how does this deck actually work? However, you know, when you draw these cards all together, all of a sudden it becomes a fantastic synergistic deck, right? You have the Cauldron Familiar, and Mayhem Devil is really kind of the key that allows you to, to have just these ridiculous turns. That's right. It's interesting because the power ceiling on the deck is actually not that high. Like, this is what it does. It can throw around some amount of damage, and it can do it over and over and over, and it can drain you 
with the Cauldron Familiar. None of these things devastating in and of themselves, but it's consistent and it can do it over and over again. The, the problem that it faces is some of the decks in the format just simply go over the top. They're like, that's cool, but here's a Hydroid Crisis, it's an 8-8 eight eight or whatever, you know, off of my Nissa or something like that, and all of a sudden they just falls too far behind, and they can do the thing, and it's just not enough. In a matchup like this, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. The thing is going to keep the board clear really nicely if, if uh, Thomas doesn't find a way to get rid of Mayhem Devil. And I think the reason why Thomas is being very careful here and making Arnal go through the motions here, this I mean, he likely has a Veil of Summer in hand, and he's trying yeah. to figure out if there's a timing window where he can actually use the Veil to save his questing beast. And, and just sort of waste a lot of action here. Right. Now that the Witch's Ovens have been used, he can no longer sacrifice the Cauldron Familiar if it's in play. And so Guillaume asked the judge, hey, can I just sacrifice this? Like, is this familiar in my graveyard? And the judge's like, sure. So that's exactly what he did. So the Questing Beast does go away. And Yem's going to need to make sure that he hits up all those triggers because every time the Cauldron Familiar comes back, it's draining for one as well. Down to 17 goes Hendrix. Ah, but here's is Glass big. Casket. And this was a big deal. Uh, you know, Gim can sometimes uh, protect his creatures with the oven of all things, which we actually saw a couple of turns ago. Devout Decree was cast by Thomas Hendrix. But Gim was able to sacrifice his card in response. Is that the card you were talking about earlier, Paul? Corvold, Fey Cursed King has now entered the battlefield. And this deck, this card can, can kind of end games very, very quickly. Now, this is, this is a card that's in Throne of Eldrain, but you won't find in a Throne of Eldrain booster pack. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, every time you sacrifice, per and this is like the true card advantage engine of the deck, right? There's not a lot. Everything yeah. else, you know, you can deal. You know, I'll read it, because there's probably right. a decent number of people that don't know the card. <laughs> it's two black, red, green for a 4-4 flying legendary dragon noble. Uh, whenever Korvald, uh, Fey Cursed King, enters the battlefield or attacks, sacrifice another permanent. Obviously not a problem for Gim. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a plus one, plus one counter on Korvald and... <clears throat> More importantly... Draw a card. Yeah. So it is an absolute machine. Yeah. With, with what Arnal has going on right now, he can draw lots and lots of cards. Yeah, this is super sweet. Now, it looks like one of the Witch's Ovens is going to get taken out by a Knight of Autumn here, though. And that does actually help, yeah, right? Like, two, two ovens going is a big deal. I mean, you got a full kitchen. Now he's down to just uh, making some pizza at home by himself. But I think that with the cards drawn off of Corvold, he's going to be just fine. Right. Arnold is sitting at six life, so maybe Thomas can try to sneak some damage through, right? The Questing Beast does have Death Touch. So will Arnold just choose to take four damage here, or is he happy with the trade after drawing all of these cards? This deck is very sweet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it struggled to find a really permanent home in the standard format. You will see it around. But... It is. It has a lot going on. Absolutely, and Corvold was kind of the missing piece because right. you know, when you look at all the other cards, they have synergy. But again, you're dealing a point of damage here and there, right? Corvold is the card that puts this deck over the top because once you draw it, and by that point you probably have some pieces of your engine intact, right. and that's when you can start drawing two, three, four cards a turn. Yeah, and you know the only bad thing about Corvold is that it gets so big so fast that the game ends before you can use all those cards. Oh, is that is that the bad thing about? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like it gets a counter. It's already a four-four flyer. By the time you swing, it's like a ten-ten. <laughs> yep, yep, that is like, true. But I had five cards I wanted yep. to cast. Like. <laughs> all right, back to our main table here where we have. Brad Nelson versus Mats Tornros, and uh, it was actually Mats who picked up the first game. A drawn-out affair, but right. one where he ended up just, uh, you know, throwing more power, more powerful cards in Brad Nelson's direction than Brad was able to throw back. It was kind of that simple at the end of the day. Yeah, but Brad with an ideal start here. He's got the Gilded Goose into Oko. Does he? Well, Gilded goose, Gilded goose into Land Pass. 
is probably what he's working <laughs> with now. Yeah, so this duress actually sniping Oko most likely and really nice there for Mons to be able to kind of dismantle. Okay. Oh, and look All at right. this. He already has an answer for Oko. He's going to take Veil of Summer. Yeah, this, tell this likely means that he has a Noxious Grasp in hand. And uh, yeah, taking a look over there, Tornros does have a Noxious Grasp in hand and would rather not play against the Veil of Summer once the ga game goes to that late game. And Veil of Summer, by the way, also out of the sideboard, is a big reason why you know a lot of those haymakers that you see in game one are much less relevant, right? We've seen the, the Salt High food decks play Casualties of War. That gets countered, right, just from, for, from, a single, from a single mana. On top of that, we've seen Bant variations play Mass Manipulation. That also gets countered by Veil of Summer. So, you know, we saw a lot of these top pros talk about how important it is to see how your opponent's sideboard to figure out what you want to be doing. What is your game plan? Did your opponent bring in all the Veil of Summers? Did your opponent bring in Hand Disruption? And then how are you going to sideboard accordingly? There's lots of things to do after sideboard. Sure. Brad's going to take it slow here, make a food with Gilded Goose. Yeah, I assume that Brad wants to find himself in a position where if he plays out Oko, he's left with something relevant, like a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. So, so he waited a turn here, and now is probably the turn where he runs out the Oko, turns his food into a 3-3 and attacks. And, you know, even if Matt does have the Noxious Grasp, he has that value. He does have some pressure on the battlefield. Meaning that if Matt follows up this Noxious Grasp with a turn 3 Oko, Brad will still have some pressure for it. Yeah. Looks like he's going to take okay. a slightly different route here and just go for the Hydroid Crisis for two, which is going to get him a card. It doesn't look like Matt wants to use the, the Noxious Grasp here. Oh, and uh oh, and oh. This is a huge spike for Brad Nelson as far as his chance to win the game. A missed land drop here from Mats. And now, did you see that? Brad just rolled up his sleeves, literally. He's yeah. just like, all right, it's time to get to work here. He's got two games to win if he's going to win this match. Finds himself down a game here. Does he want to play it slow here, or does he want to be aggressive? It looks like he might just run out a Wicked Wolf here with no targets because it will be safe to a Noxious Grasp given that food token on the battlefield. So now, because Matt's missed the land drop, he might just have to use a Noxious Grasp to preserve his life total. Yeah, he's going to. Also, you do not want to let Brad get you in this position where he knows what he's figured out what you have. And he's never going to give you an inch. He will never let you get good value off of that thing. So smart play there from Mutz to give himself a chance to potentially scrap back into this game if he starts finding his lance, which he didn't. And I th is it going to be Oko time now? Okay, sure. so he's making a food here just in case. There's another Noxious Crest. But now he's going to be able to attack for six and still keep up protection on the Wicked Wolf. This one's going to go to Brad Nelson in short order here. Ooh, as I say that, there is a breeding pool. I assume it's too late. Yeah, Brad just seems to have a little too much pressure on the battlefield. And if Brad can follow this up with anything, it's going to be very, very tough for, for Mats. There's Oko. But make a food, and Oko's just going to get killed immediately. Unless Brad has a lethal attack, right? He can attack for nine, potentially, here. Oh. And if he stacks a food, that's ten. If he found oh, and he found, a gilded, he found a Gilded Goose as well. So, so let's see. If, if he plays Gilded Goose, that's, that's 11 damage. I, th I believe this is just a lethal attack. 11's enough. Yeah, he can turn his current Gilded Goose into a 3-3. Three, three. That's, that's an attack for 9. Or, I mean, there's just all kinds of different ways here. <laughs> All right. At any rate, you heard Mott say, eh, I'm going to scoop him up yeah. there. So game number two goes to Brad Nelson capitalizing on the mana stumble there. And uh, this is a harsh environment. You know, sometimes these the, the standard mirror, the, uh, the Simic, or uh, in this case, Sultai mirror, can go for quite a while. Um, but it is also harsh. If, right. if you stumble, if you don't have a color of mana, if you don't have your third land drop, you can absolutely get rolled. Right, definitely. And, you know, there, there are some important cards that you absolutely have to have in that matchup. And 
One of the most important things is, of course, having mana. Having those mana creatures early is, is huge. And Mads probably thought his hand was reasonable given that he was on the draw, had two lands, had the rest, and the Noxious Crest. But his hand just didn't really come together for, for the rest of that game. All right, so let's get back over to Thomas Hendricks versus Guillaume Salvador Arnal. And uh, we got to see uh, Guillaume kind of put on a show, you know, busting out the big guns for us that time with Corvold and his combo kind of in full swing. And that's including, if we remember, a sequence where Thomas Hendricks went off. I mean, yeah. you know, he had two edge wall innkeepers, dumped his hand, pumped them up and everything, and just lost. You know, I just think that the way that the cards line up, this is just tough for Hendrix. Arnal has all kinds of ways to to kind of deal one damage to a lot of these smaller creatures. And, you know, I, I think Thomas specifically brought this deck to try to combat the various Oko decks that he expected. Certainly not really looking forward to playing a, a sacrifice deck that has the ability to just distribute one damage wherever it wants. like Angrath's Rampage here for Kiem. And this will be nice because Thomas will be forced to sacrifice a creature which will then tr trigger the Mayhem Devil and will be able to kill another one when that's in play. Yeah, and as we can see on the board, oh, and look at this. Thomas is just going to get rid of the Lovestruck Beast itself. Because he just knows he's not going to be able he's to like, attack He's like, I'm not going to have a 1-1, one -one. yeah. yeah. So one of the soldiers gets hit, and then another one's going to get hit. And there's going to be some life gain there for Guillaume. Now, I don't see a Cauldron Familiar anywhere. And the reason why he's doing all of this is in the main phase is he's concerned about a card like Venerated Loxodon. When you when you play enough matches against the, the Selesnya Convoke strategy, you, you want to keep them as low on permanence as possible so they can't play a giant march of the multitudes or one of those Venerated Loxodons. But Arnal is out of out of gas potentially here. Yeah. He just has the main though. He has two witches ovens, but he has he hasn't found the cauldron familiar to kind of get that engine going. Hendrix must have an answer for this mayhem devil. No. Fable Passage is a nice little interaction as well. That's also a sacrifice effect for the Mayhem Devil. It is. And it's just going to sit there, perhaps dissuading Thomas Hendricks from doing anything. But Hendricks was in a line where he was tapping down the Mayhem Devil. Then he decided not to, and then he exchanged three damage for one. Wow, Arnell. But now we're back to Arnell tap. also has Flame Sweep in his sideboard. That, this is this oh is just very gosh. very tough. You got You got to feel for Hendricks, who did pick up game number one, but has really got his hands full here and just is kind of flooding out here. Now he's got another land and a, a pair of Flower Flourish in hand, and and it looks like Gem is just like, I've had enough. Let's just get that thing out of here. Hey, if this is all you got, if you're just gonna flood out, I'm gonna start slamming with this. There thing. it is. Dang, what did he find? The cat. The cat. That, you know, that's going to put him way, 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 way ahead now. Yeah, definitely. With the, with two of the Witch's Ovens in play. In fact, yeah. it's over, and Thomas Hendricks says, I've just flooded out. I don't Can't have anything I can do. Can't beat the cat. You could hear they were talking about that play where uh, there was Massacre Girl with no one toughness creatures, but a two toughness goose that he sacrificed. And they were, they were kind of going over that play. This is my favorite part, by the way, about these tournaments. I mean, you know, there's so much on the line here. But still, at the end of the day, this is a game. And all these players just want to continue learning and getting better at the game. And they just go back and forth. It's like, OK, yeah. what are some of the things I could have done? It's like, hey, did I do anything wrong? Did you yep. see anything? What did you think about this play that I took? And should should I have sideboarded this in? Exactly. And you'll see people who just bitterly fought it out just give each other advice genuinely. Yeah. All right, game number three between Brad and Mats is upon us. Brad with the Gilded Goose to kick things off, but Mats looking a little suspicious there with his island and forest. <laughs> Maybe Brad thinking about Aethergust as a possibility? 
He doesn't have one, though. Yeah, it looks like he just has a turn three Oko. But Brad, I mean, this is this is the ideal start, right? Every 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 game, you just want to start with turn one Goose, turn two Paradise Dread. This opens the window for a potential turn three Nissa who shakes the world. And now, given that Mats is tapped out, if Brad does have land Nissa, he's just going to slam it here. If he does so, that will be a giant step for him in the right direction. He's got the breeding pool. It does not have the Nissa. You can take a look at what's in his hand on the left-hand side of your screen there. Looks like he's going to have to settle for Oko Thief of Crowns. Sure. Yeah, not bad. I wonder if he's going to get aggressive here. He is not. No, interesting. He didn't quite have enough power to actually kill Oko. The oh, I Oko. think I think this might just be a noxious grass. Okay, well okay. he does have enough <laughs> cards right. to do so. And, and this is also, by the way, why the mana creatures are so important. I mean, Brad was able to double spell this turn and just have the tempo firmly on his side. This starts off innocently enough as well. Hydroid Crisis, just for two. Just draw me a card, get me a life. And pass a turn back. Yeah, but this time Brad is the one that's applying pressure here. He's got that active Oko in play with all the mana. And look at this. He's got Breeding Pool and Casualties of War. He can actually cast the Casualties of War this turn if he wants. Wow, right. with and no black lands. Yeah, and that would that would leave Mats with just three forests in play. Also potentially keep him off that, that pivotal land number five for Nissa who shakes the world. So I wonder if that's what Brad's going to be looking to do or if he's going to just play it a little patient and just wait for Mats to run out the Nissa so then he can use the Casualties of War to get that off the field. 17. But it's so tempting because if, you, if your opponent maybe brought in something like a Veil of Summer, all of a sudden your casualties of war is not quite as effective, right? Seriously. So it like, seems like I'd feel some seems serious like you pressure to do it, it now. Yeah. And look at this, a three for one when your opponent has six total permanents. Wow. That. How's your forest doing over there, bud? Your move. <laughs> Brutal hey, stuff. No land, nothing. Wow. Brad Nelson dropping the hammer on Mats Tornros here with casualties of war against an opponent who was already struggling on mana and probably just locking this thing up right there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, now now he's got the once upon a time, very likely to find additional action here. He's got an active Oko with eight loyalty in play. And yeah, Mats missing that land drop was huge. He has to, he absolutely needs to draw land number four next turn to even have a chance. He's got that Wicked Wolf, start things off, get that Gilded Goose off the table. So Brad is going to awaken his food token. And probably just start going to work on the life total here of Mats. He needs to slam the door. Because realistically, if Mats doesn't draw a land here, it's kind of over. Right. But if he does, then Brad needs to have gained some ground here while the shields were down. It's another So many goods. permanents here. Yeah, and of course, Oko. Yeah, there's no another land. four drop. So that is real, really realistically going to be it. And Brad knows it. You can see he's untapping very quickly. Brad looking to be 7-0 to kick off his day with one more round to go. He's got to be feeling great. Oh, yeah. Here's Once Upon a Time, or Owat. <laughs> yeah. Owat? 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 Yeah. It looks like he might have, you know, somewhat missed here. Doesn't really need the mana. But it looks like that was the only really legal target for here, for him, rather. Yeah, raise your hand if you feel bad for him. Yeah, I think he's going to be doing <laughs> just fine. He just, he, he just took out half of his opponent's permanence. I mean, this this is just a two-turn clock, right? I mean, we yeah. have we're, we have an attack for eight, and next turn, an attack for 11, so. And, and unfortunately, it was exactly the perfect land, giving him access to both blue and black mana. But it doesn't matter. He's completely overwhelmed on the board. And Brad Nelson advances to 7-0 and with just one more round of standard to go here today. Brad could be undefeated. Yeah. That is a tough customer. I mean, either way, coming into tomorrow, if he's 7-1 and or 8-0, and he's got to love his spot. But, you know, honestly, it's really not that surprising, right? Not only is Brad known to be one of the best standard players in the world, mm -hmm. 
the best deck in standard right now is a mid-range green deck. Yes. That is kind of exactly in his wheelhouse. So again, not surprised that he's 7-0 right now. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, great stuff from Brad Nelson. One more round to go to see if he's going to be undefeated and join. It's really hard. You know, there's a lot of players that you'll be big fans of that never actually went undefeated on day one of a Mythic Championship. It's really difficult to do. So Brad will be trying for that next round. In the meantime, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we've got a sweet deck tech at the uh, at the at the news desk a little bit of fires going on over there if you ever want to learn about that one we'll take a short break we'll be back right after this